All right, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's edition of The Great Movies, a discussion of detective story from 1951 with our special guest, Alan K. Rohde. I will formally introduce Alan in just a few moments. My name is Andy Wolverton, and I'm joined once again by my partner in crime, Darnese Jasper. Darnese and I are both librarians in the Anne Arundel County, Maryland public library system, which along with the Library Foundation sponsors this program. So our next virtual meeting is gonna be on Friday, September the 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern when we discuss the 1982 documentary, Say Amen Somebody. And you can sign up for that discussion actually starting today. And some of you have already signed up for it, which is great. And I'm putting that link in the chat and there it goes. Then on Friday, September the 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern, we'll have another special guest, classic film fan and writer Jessica Pickens will join us to discuss Love with the Proper Stranger from 1963, starring Steve McQueen and Natalie Wood. And you can bookmark that page now in just a moment. And signups for that begin on September the 9th. So there we go with that one. Okay. And if you're new to our discussions, I know we have several new people tonight. We're super glad to have you along. Glad you could make it. And if you'd like to join our email notifications list, please send me an email at awolverton at aacpl.net. And I think Darnese has probably plugged that in and she did, as always, watching my back. That way you'll get all the news about our upcoming events before anybody else. Also, please know that we want as many people participating as possible tonight. So if you have a question or a comment, please raise your real hand or your virtual hand, or you can use the chat feature and Darnese will be glad to work you into the conversation. We also ask that you please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Okay, I think that's it for the regular stuff there. Does anybody have any questions about any of that or anything else? Okay, great. All right, so I've known tonight's guest for a few years, getting to know him at several Noir City Film Festival events, and I know some of you already know him. Uh, some of you may remember him from the last time we had him on the show to discuss The Proud Rebel last year. Our guest has written some outstanding books, including... Charles McGraw, film noir, Tough Guy. And his most recent book is now in hardcover, paperback, and audiobook, Michael Curtiz, A Life in Film. Our guest also runs the Author Lions Film Noir Festival each year in Palm Springs, California. And you can see him at Noir City, Chicago next week from August 26th through September the 1st. And you know, here we go at no extra cost. I'm gonna put that <laughs> in the chat as well. And if you are in the Chicago area, uh, I urge you to go to this festival. Unfortunately, I can't go this year. I have been in the past. It is terrific. And let's see, did that, Darnies, did that go through? No, it didn't. Okay, let me try it again. Sorry about that. And bear with me. How about now? No. Oh, oh, I know what's going on. Are you sending it privately? I sent it to, to someone privately. Yes. <laughs> we don't want to do that. All right. How about that? Yes. Now you've All got right. it. Third time's the charm. Okay. <laughs> so even if you're not able to see him in person, you can always check out Alan's many audio commentaries on DVD and Blu-ray. Those are always entertaining and informative. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big welcome to tonight's guest, Alan K. Rohde. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me say uh, thank Andy and Darnese for having me back. Uh, it's fun to be back. And I see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of Chicago people that I'm going to see uh, in a couple of weeks uh, and, and looking very much looking forward to that. And I think we have another author 
Ann Allison, who's written a great book uh, about the best years of our lives that I recently introduced on, uh, I believe, Memorial Day at the Hollywood Legion Theater, and it's one of my favorite films. So welcome, Allison, here as well, joining our group. So it's great to be here. And Andy, thank you for, for pimping my books. I always like that. <laughs> Particularly, I noticed you needed two hands to hold Michael Curtiz. You know, yes. I recommend that. Uh, <clears throat> but at any rate, it's it's good to be here, and uh, it's good to talk about Detective Story. And uh, that's a film that I'm very fond of uh, for a couple reasons, and and I'm sure that'll come out in in the in the context of our conversation. And uh, I did a long audio commentary on it that will be coming out from two different companies. I found out this audio commentary business is not covered by like the Screen Actors Guild or residuals. And I, I kind of, the, the people who work that circuit, uh, you're kind of living in the days of Harry Cohn and Jack L. Warner when it comes to residuals. And uh, I found out that another company has purchased some of my audio commentaries oh. that I've done for uh, uh, Via Vision, a company in Australia, and they're going to be releasing them in America. So at any rate, more of me than anyone can stand. But uh, And I'll be showing Detective Story. I actually programmed it as one of the films in uh, Chicago. So uh, I think it's a terrific film, very entertaining, and uh, I'm glad to be here with all of you to discuss it. Great. Well, Alan, let me, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then we're going to open it up to everybody. So, um, and you kind of, you kind of alluded to this already, but what, what is it about detective story that speaks to you? Well, I think detective story is really now a piece of urban Americana. Uh, it, 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 you know, the, the play goes back to the late 1940s and the movie 1951 and, and, as I get on, uh, I look back and that was like really a long time ago. This is like, you know, over 70 years ago and how society, cultural mores, how the police operated, uh, even though it's dramatized in this movie, things have really changed. Yet the subjects that are addressed in the movie remain a, one could say, a relentless, uh, non-changing part of our cultural fabric. Uh, how the police interact with the public, uh, appropriately or inappropriately. Uh, the subject of abortion, which seemingly will never go away as we continue to have a society with men telling women what they can do or can't do with their bodies. Uh, uh, all of that stuff and then uh, from a strictly dramatic point of view, uh, you have, in my opinion, one of the greatest American directors, William Wyler, matched with a, a just a wonderful, wonderful cast, and Kirk Douglas and Eleanor Parker, first and foremost. And uh, I got to know Eleanor Parker and spent some time with her and had long conversations with her. Uh, and I spent a day with Kirk Douglas that's, that's uh, one of my one of my uh, fun memories because he was uh, even though he was I think he was about ninety or ninety one uh, he left no doubt that Spartacus still lived <laughs> during the time I spent with Kirk uh, and he was he was he was great he was great to me uh, he really was so um, I, I really think that uh, it it's a film that says something and I also feel that's because it's a because it's a play. And you can tell it's a play. It does have a certain amount of that stage bound stuff. Although when they did the play, you had the two stars were Ralph Bellamy. And that's kind of hard to imagine the avuncular Ralph Bellamy that we know from the 30s and His Girl Friday and all those movies playing a role that Kirk Douglas brings this fuel injected rage that only Kirk could do, but it, it starred Ralph Bellamy and Meg Monday, who was really a stage actress to, who's not well known to, to cinephiles. And um, it, it, um, it really, uh, the, the drama and the visceralness of the emotion of the piece really still resonates with me. And, and the pain, the pain that Kirk Douglas's character goes through, the pain 
of their marriage and how this one tumultuous day turns their lives upside down. So uh, I think drama is always about human conflict and human emotion. And I think that there is a lot of that in this film that that is really um, uh, it's it's really prime beef if you're for those of you that are a meat eater. Uh, uh, and I really I really enjoy the film while recognizing that some of the stuff is dated, some of the performances may be viewed as over the top and so forth. But to me, that doesn't make it any less enjoyable. Yeah. Alan, I, I listened to, I have the Via Vision Blu-ray and on the commentary, you do discuss a lot of those issues about the differences between the play and the film and a lot of the challenges that they had with the production code. Can mm -hmm. you talk about some of the specific things that were really some of the biggest challenges that they had to face with the film? First? Well, the, the big thing was the abortion, uh, the abortion issue. The play was able to essentially take the issue of abortion and put it out there where uh, 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 McLeod, uh, uh, Kirk Douglas, Ralph Bellamy's wife, uh, has an abortion in, in her past before they were married, and this comes back uh, when he's hounding uh, this abortionist. And basically, the, the, because of the production code, they couldn't talk about any of this. In fact, uh, Willie Wyler gave an interview to the New York Times saying, this is so ridiculous. He said, uh, he said you know, the detective story, how the script was adapted, it's an anti-abortion statement, but we're not even allowed to talk about it. And this is America. Why can't we have a why can't we have an adult movie in 1950 or 1951 where we can have this discussion? And and Joe Joseph Breen, who I've read dozens of his memoranda, just said uh, by the production code, and by this time the production code was written in 1930. And now here we are 20 years later, World War II really changed everything. Society had moved on from whalebone corsets and the buggy whip. So, uh, but the production code and Breen were still there and he was adamant. So they had to kind of dance under this limbo bar by having the doctor played by George McCready, who I always thought it would be romantic if you found out McCready got that scar on his cheek from like a duel or a fencing thing. Unfortunately, it was a, a 1919 automobile accident. Uh, but um, so they had to say that uh, he was a baby doctor and the baby was born dead. And they had to do this limbo dance under the the bar of the uh, of the production code. And that was there was a lot of correspondence back and forth, and I cite all of that, a lot of that in the commentary. The other thing that they got a special waiver of, and, and I'm assuming that everyone has, has seen this film, so you know, don't, don't send me any spoiler notes, leave now, um, <laughs> was uh, part of the code was you're not supposed to see a criminal kill a policeman. And they had a, you know, that was that was a real issue. But Breen, you know, Breen was a, even though he was uh, a moralist, uh, he was also a realist. And he realized that uh, to an extent that time had moved on. So you do have uh, Joe Wiseman shooting Kirk Douglas and killing him at the climax of the film. The interesting sidelight to that is that Weiler, wanted to film that with Wiseman holding a gun and shooting it close up, like sticking it right near his stomach and shooting it. And Kirk Douglas said, wait a minute, you know, blanks can be dangerous when the wad <laughs> comes out. Of that. Wow. And I really don't want somebody shooting a blank at me at close range. And Weiler and he argued about that. So he said, I'll tell you what, why don't you do this as a test? string up a piece of cheesecloth and then fire the gun and see what happens. So they did that and the cheesecloth had all these holes in it. And Kirk Douglas just went. Okay. <laughs> so as you can see, the, the, the shooting at the climax is staged with the two of them far apart and then Kirk Douglas walks towards him and so on and so forth. But the big thing was no descriptions and then waltzing around 
uh, the whole thing of a woman having sex out of wedlock. I mean, God forbid that this could ever happen. And so that, that had to be handled with kid gloves. So uh, a lot of this was, was sanitized by the production code, but I'll give Weiler credit. The whole issue of abortion and, and what they tried to put lace curtains around all of this, it comes through very, very clearly. Uh, the, the point, the main points of this uh, were still made. So uh, I think he did a very artful job. And because it was a movie, and he had more uh, laissez-faire because it was on the stage. This was the detective, the detective squad room, and then you had another set next to it with a door, which was uh, uh, Lieutenant Monahan's office, Horace McMahon in the movie. So you had two sets, and so uh, Weiler was able to open it up and let the film breathe a little bit because you had you had the film opens outside with a shot of New York. And and stock music by uh, uh, stock music taken from the accused, and use that, and and then they had him going in the station, and you had the scene on the roof with Bendix and Douglas, and he was able to use like I think six different sets, but most of it does take place in the squad room, most of the action, and so on and so forth. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, let's open it up to some questions and comments from the audience. And Darnese, do we have anybody lined up? Not yet. Oh, Not Bob. yet. Mm -hmm. We'll go with Bob and then Susan. Okay. Um, I don't know who to thank for putting this on the schedule, but in the end, for the 20 years or so that we've been doing these discussions, <laughs> um, I've never enjoyed a movie uh, so much as this. You can see right off the bat how much this movie uh, owes to the original movie, Naked City, and how much the uh, subsequent uh, TV series uh, uh, is indebted to it as well. This Horace McMahon uh, was a fixture on the TV series when that True. came out a few years later. Um, I thought the print was just perfect. It was like watching a series of, of high resolution photographs. Um, now, of course, they're gonna do the usual foreshadowing when the lawyer is showing the police nude photos of George McCready. And uh, so at some point he's got to get banged up. And I thought, yeah, this guy has the greatest voice that ever was in the movies. And if there's anything that can bring him down to earth for the rest of us, it would be nude photos. I would have liked to have seen <laughs> uh, photos a, a great deal. I mean, he's otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll pass on new George <laughs> McCready. I hope you understand that. <laughs> I also read, yeah. I also read yeah. in, the, uh, in the original stage play that uh, uh, Kingsley's uh, uh, two uh, two uh, burglars, uh, Charlie and uh, what's it, Lewis? Joe, Joe Wiseman and Michael Strong. Yes, they were from the they were from the original uh, stage play. Right, those guys was, were supposed to be gay, right. but uh, yeah. they, they left that out. This, yeah. The two things I thought that this movie had going for it more than anything else was a cast that you just, you have to be in awe of. And, uh, and a screenplay, or I don't know how much of it was the original play, uh, just lines that you would die for. For instance, when uh, Kirk Douglas was he said, you want my badge? You can have it now with directions. I, that's perfect with directions. Oh God, I wish I had written that. And then toward the end when uh, well, Kirk Douglas is saying, okay, what color are your eyes? And the guy says, greenish. And he's, no, they look brown to me. And the Kathy O'Donnell says, they're hazel. <laughs> You know, you, you just can't, it, it was just utterly perfect. And every scene that uh, Joe Wiseman was in deserved an Academy Award. Um, and Lee Grant, every time a, a desk drawer opened, a chair scraped, uh, a door slammed, she looked like she was uh, hit by a 10,000 volts in the neck. I mean, she was just jumping. It was just 
perfect. Everything about this movie, I, I thought. And it, of course, when you see um, uh, Douglas uh, smack uh, McReady, you know this movie cannot have a happy ending. Uh, and you're just trying to figure out how they're going to work it uh, so that everything goes to hell in the last five minutes, as it clearly does. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to see it. I had never seen it, and I can't think of anything maybe but double indemnity that I've enjoyed of this genre more. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so this is the second week in a row that Bob has loved our movies. I'm a little afraid of this. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know if we can sustain this. Pressure. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of pressure. But well, we <laughs> one one of the interesting things was Kingsley and Willie Wyler were were close friends, and this goes back to when uh, um, Wyler adapted Dead End from Kingsley's play in 1937, and they stayed close friends. And um, the detective story was such a hit on stage that they uh, Paramount paid like two hundred and sixty five thousand dollars plus a percentage of the uh, uh, of the profits or the gross of the movie. I'm not sure which one to Kingsley in order to make this movie. And that was that was the biggest amount paid, I think, until or since Born Yesterday that Harry Cohn ponied up a million dollars for that. But uh, that was a lot of money in 1950, 1949. And, uh, and Kingsley and Weiler, in fact, Kingsley said afterwards, he said, I think the movie was better than the play, mm -hmm. uh, which, which was, uh, uh, you, you know, you can't give a filmmaker a better compliment than that from a playwright. Yeah. Okay, so we've got Susan next and then Allison. Uh, hi, this is really interesting. I thought, uh, it might be a little bit controversial today, but so far it's been pretty good. Um, I have a couple of art, uh, disagreements about the performance uh, for Lee Grant's performance and also the uh, the thief uh, named Charlie, who I understand is the same guy that played Dr. No. Not sure if Joe, that's true. Yeah, Joe, Joe Wiseman, Joe Wiseman. Anyway, I thought they were they were way overacting for that small, confined space it just too much screaming lee grant her gestures it was too methody for me it wasn't like movie acting it was like stage acting um although i did like the story a lot i've seen this movie before um one of the things i thought was really cool about it was how weiler directed the simultaneous actions of the various characters that were always doing something they weren't just sitting around. They were doing their police work. Every once in a while, somebody would go through that little gate and it would smack and the guy would kick it back into place. I mean, really, really, I'm sure hard to direct that kind of action that's going on. Um, and the other, the last thing I'd like to talk about is praise for William Bendix, who mm -hmm. I've never thought William Bendix was really that much of an actor, but he, he was so good in this part as the cop with a heart. And, you know, being it was made in 1950 or 51, but, you know, at the very end where he had to defer to um, Kirk McLeod, Kirk Douglas's character, and he, he couldn't take that step to go against one of his fellow cops, but his performance humanized this whole movie. Um, yeah, that, those are some really good comments. Uh, Joe Wiseman, this was his first film. He had made like a documentary having to do with the Ladies uh, Garment Workers Union that was shot in New York before this. Uh, but he was a stage actor and Joe was playing to the last seat in the balcony in this movie. There's no question about that. <laughs> and and he he kind of he reminded me of like Lee Cobb on some sort of steroid medication because <laughs> he, he was really, you know, going for the, the exaggerated gestures. And, and Joe Wiseman was a great actor, but I don't think he had learned to do that. And I think Wise, uh, Bill, Willie Wyler just let him go. Because even though it's obvious that he's doing too much and he's overacting, it's all enjoyable as hell 
So I think he just let him go. Uh, Lee, uh, I tend to disagree a little bit, uh, Susan, with that. I think, uh, yeah, maybe her gestures were extravagant, but uh the 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 uh the character how she brought the character which was you know kind of uh you kind of ended up feeling sorry for her and and she was kind of an airhead let's face it the, the character in the movie uh but i thought she was great and evidently other people did too because she was nominated for academy award for her performance so i i i i agree with you on joe wiseman and i uh, uh, respectfully disagree with you on Lee Grant. Okay, okay. Um, Allison's next. Um, Susan, I, I totally agree about William Bendix. It was so great to see him be um, <clears throat> so fleshed out, you know, not the guy with the plate in his head like we see a lot. Um, but Alan, I had a question about Eleanor Parker. When you um, oh. talked to her, did she speak at all about what it was like to work with Weiler on this? I think they had a couple of weeks of rehearsals for this film. Yes, they did. Uh, I asked Eleanor, I said, so what happened to 110 take Weiler? And uh, she said, well, she said, we had, we had kind of secret rehearsals, meaning that the, uh, the studio didn't know about them and we rehearsed for two weeks. And he said the way things were in 1950 with television and the whole industry compressing, he said there was no way that Paramount was going to indulge Willie Wilder with all the takes that he used, say, in The Heiress, where, you know, he shot like 37 takes of a scene with Olivia de Havilland and so on and so forth. He said he was very, very efficient, very, very efficient. Of course, being that he was Willie Wilder, he still didn't tell anybody what he really wanted. Uh, and he never told anyone you're doing good or, you know, Weiler was not like a football coach type of director at all. And in fact, Kirk, I believe Kirk Douglas told me that um, Weiler never told him during the entire film if he was good or bad, but years later, he ran into him at some function and Weiler said, yeah, you know, I saw a detective story on television the other night. You were really good. And this was like 15 years after the movie had been done. So and that was just that was just Weiler. That was that was how he was. Uh, you know, another story was um, uh, Chuck Heston making Ben Hur. And uh, that was, you know, multi million dollar all chips on the table for MGM. And uh, they're at Cinecita in, in Italy, and they started the first week or so. And uh, Heston is, it's the end of the day, and Weiler says, I'd like to talk to you. And he said, you know, Chuck, the future of MGM, the future of the studio, maybe the future of movies is resting on this film. And this film is resting on your performance. And I have to tell you, uh, so far, you're just not good enough. And so Heston went, Ugh. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you want me to do? And he, Weiler said, I don't know. You know, it would be easy if I knew what to tell you to do. And that <laughs> way I could tell you and then you do it and it would be fine. He said, I don't know exactly what to tell you on what you need to do, but I just need to tell you that you have to be better. So have a good night's sleep. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so, so Heston had to deal with that. And he said he drank about half a bottle of wine and redoubled his effort. And I think, you know, uh, regardless of one's opinion of, of the 59 version of Ben Hur, I think that, you know, it, obviously everything came out all right. So, yeah, but, but uh, Eleanor, uh, she said that everybody on the set was professional. Uh, working with Kirk was fine. There were no no problems whatsoever. And, and Eleanor always impressed me as a total professional on how she did stuff. I mean, I remember asking her about Curtiz and uh, she said, well, you know, he had this terrible reputation with actors, but when I worked with him uh, and she said, uh, uh, admittedly, it was not a large part on uh, mission to Moscow and it was early in my career, but he said he was completely polite and professional to me. I had no problems with him and he knew exactly what he was doing. So, you know, uh, in fact, the only time she told me anything bad about anybody, she says, isn't this boring, Alan? I'm telling you how much everyone is wonderful and I like this person. 
And she said, there's only one person I can think about, but I don't want to mention his name. And I said, well, come on, dish, Eleanor. You know, you got to give me something here. And it was Stuart Granger. She just said he was the biggest gaping SOB of all time. And, and you know, she said on Scaramouche, uh, people were taking bets when a grip would drop a light on him or something. He, he was just really, really obnoxious. Uh, but other than that, Eleanor was was just a total pro. And uh, her experience on Detective Story, as she put it to me, was was overwhelmingly positive. She's just brings so much light to the this film, I think. I really like her. In it. Oh, she's she's brilliant. She's just brilliant in the film. And uh, I mean, she followed she was following being nominated uh, for one of my favorite pictures, Caged. Mm -hmm. which is a tour de force uh, performance for uh, a, a female actor in 1950. Just incredible. And that was that uh, Caged and Interrupted Melody were Eleanor's two favorite films. Mm -hmm. uh, and she loved Caged, she said, because it was mostly all of us women and it wasn't a hen party. We just had fun and Hope Emerson would play a piano and sing on the set in between uh, in between takes and she brought her mother down and you know the only thing she told me was that uh, I, the scene where she gets her hair shaved by uh, Hope Emerson I said well, that wasn't really your hair she said no of course not it was a wig but Jack Warner said why don't you tell the newspapers that it was really your hair that we shaved and he's, I told Jack Warner I'm not going to lie I'm not going <laughs> to do that you know she said I don't lie I don't tell stories she said I'll tell a white lie to spare somebody's feelings but I don't I didn't go along with with Jack, but he said, but that was Jack Warner, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Awesome. Okay, That's we great. got Jeff next. Um, yeah, uh, I, Alan, I had never seen this, never heard of this movie, so this was a it was a really nice surprise. Great. And in watching it, it, it struck me very early on that this is really, really an actor's movie. You know, like it really demands high performance from these guys and i'll confess that i'm not always a big kirk douglas fan but i generally like him more in films where he's he's troubled and he's got a, a very a dark side to his personality and and this is dovetails perfectly into that and uh watching this performance from start to finish uh, i thought you know he really put himself through a meat grinder in, in doing this film you know, it was just great work and uh, it, it couldn't have been easy as an actor to to put yourself through this so um just high high praise for his work in this but also eleanor parker as well and i and i loved that where they took that character because she could have just very easily been the meek wife who you know endures all this but but she's got a bit of sandpaper too you know she she fights back on him and and i love those those passages at the end with with the discussion of whether are they going to save this marriage is she going to stay is she going to walk and uh, just really great work with those two and a couple of people have already mentioned william bendix in this as well and i was really gratified to see him play a part like this because he traditionally plays played either heavies and or kind of dull-witted guys and this character had some real humanity to it. it it's not a big big part but he, he does great work in this and and i and i love to see that so yeah. uh i agree i agree with you uh jim westerfield james westerfield played the brody part on the broadway play he's the uh very familiar actor. Uh, for those of you who've seen On the Waterfront, he was Big Mac, the guy, the hiring boss that would blow the whistle at the at the shape up. Uh, and and the Brody part was built up uh, for Bendix because Bendix had a really unbelievably lucrative contract at RKO that Howard Hughes very foolishly gave him and was paying him a ton of money while he was driving the studio into the ground. But yeah, I agree with you. Bendix gives the humanity uh, to the piece uh, as well. And, uh, um, uh, and, and I've always liked Bendix, but I agree that so often, you know, the, the blue Dahlia plate in the head, getting driven crazy by music and the, the cop or the guy chasing Robert Mitchum through Mexico or the dimwit cop, with Abbott and Costello and all that other stuff that he was, uh, that he, he was usually kind of typecasted on, but he really showed you, I think a lot of depth in this piece and uh, was very, very good. 
Okay. okay. Who's next, Arnie? Do we have We anybody? have no one else with their hands up, but if anybody no has one? something to add about the... You got Alan K. Rohde here. Take advantage okay. of it. Okay. All right, so um, we'll, see, go, uh, we'll yeah. go with D first, because okay. Allison okay. already spoke, and then we'll go with Allison. Mm -hmm. uh, if I understand correctly, I think there were four actors in the movie playing the same role that they had played in the Broadway play. Uh, so there was Lee Grant, there were the two burglars, and then the lieutenant. Horace and, McMahon. And I was really struck, yeah, Horace McMahon, and I was really struck at how um, McMahon's acting was just right for a film. One of the things I love in films is that we're close enough that we can even see a flicker in an eye. You know, that we, you don't need the big movements that you need on the stage. And uh, I wasn't familiar with the Horace McMahon's work, but when I looked, indeed, he had been, although he was also a stage actor, he had been in films for over 20 years, I think, at that point. Mm -hmm. And so that that probably made some of the difference. And so I yeah. just wanted to mention that. Oh, absolutely. Horace McMahon was, uh, he was like the prototype. When you saw him, you say, that's how a New York homicide NYPD lieutenant should look like, should talk. And and I grew up near New York. And when McMahon goes, he's got his quakes, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a quintessential uh, uh, New York accent, New Yorker stuff. And and um, this was when the transition. Uh, I think Bob brought up the similarity between this movie and certain aspects in The Naked City. And I think one of the interesting things is when you watch The Naked City, which was kind of revolutionary because they put a camera in the car on the streets of the Lower East Side and New York and all of that. Um, this was in 47 and this was really before TV took over. And you had all these people out on the street, out on the street at night, hanging out, walking around. You still had horse-drawn uh, 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 wagons delivering milk and delivering ice and so on and so forth. And in Detective Story, you, you still have some of that uh, motif where, uh, you know, Horace McMahon says, yeah, my, when my wife, you know, why I hate, m listen to mysteries with my wife, because I hate mysteries, I want to throw the radio outside the window of my apartment, you know, so you really, I, uh, the thing about that, you really got that sense of the urban, uh, the urban environment living in New York City, and what New York City was like uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, and, uh, you know, what New York was like when I got acquainted with it in the late 50s and early 60s. And the last time I was back there, that doesn't exist anymore. It really doesn't. Time, nothing stays the same. Time just moves on. But uh, I think in a lot of ways, Detective Story is a time capsule of that urban era, as I said on the top, uh, that, that, is, that is very interesting and entertaining to me. Thank you. Um, Allison and then Lisa. You know, Alan, one of the things that I tried to sort of figure out and understand um, when I was writing about best years was the relationship um, professionally with William Wyler and his brother Robert, you know, who later became more of a contributor. And mm -hmm. he's credited on this film. Can you talk at all about that? And, and what yeah, he was, he was very close to his brother. Yeah. And uh, w one of the things I find interest that's really interesting about the script credit is that uh, Robert Weiler, who, by the way, was married to Kathy O'Donnell, who was in the movie, and I believe they met on Best Years. They did. And, yeah. and, and got married at that, that Philip Yorden, Phil Yorden, gets co-screenwriter credit. And Phil Yorden trying to, I wrote a long piece on him about 12 years ago that's still on my website for those who are interested. And Phil Yorden was, so, he was kind of like the Hollywood version of a confidence man. I, I, there is no way to figure out what did Phil Yorden really write? Uh, uh, and and uh, 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 Bertrand Tavernier and I had a long conversation about that one time because he interviewed uh, uh, why, uh, he interviewed Jordan for Cash Heiress to Cinema 
way back in the 60s and Jordan told him all this stuff about how he wrote this and did this and did that. And, and it was all false. He basically used blacklisted writers. Uh, he gave them half the money. He took the other half and he got the screen credit so they could work. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did that with Bernie Gordon and the Barsmans and a lot of people. Uh, and looking at the play itself, I have a copy of the play. There's a lot of the play, obviously, um, in this movie, but there were changes made not only for censorship reasons, but for, for cinematic reasons or dramatic reasons, or Weiler wanted it. And um, uh, I can't figure out, well, who made those changes? Was it, I, I would tend to believe it was Robert Weiler, but on the other hand, if Phil Jordan was just uh, a, uh, uh, couldn't write and couldn't do all this stuff, then how the hell did he make all these movies with Anthony Mann? And how did he work with w Willie and Robert Weiler? So uh, uh, um, Arnold Lavin, uh, who uh, worked with uh, worked with Jordan on Anna Lucasta, and made that movie, the Anna Lucasta movie, told me that Jordan was a really good spitballer and knew how to work with the script and knew how to punch up dialogue, but he was in no way like a person that would create something out of a piece of cloth and and turn it into you know a suit. He was someone that would take a suit and make the lapels a little wider, and fix the cuffs and do all that. Uh, uh, but uh, I would like to know, but I, I do know that, uh, I don't know that much about uh, the Weilers, but I do know that Willie and Robert were very, very close. Yeah, very, very they, close. yeah they were. And, and I would imagine that, you know, he was involved too and maybe things with Kathy O'Donnell's part in this. Oh um, yeah, I'm sure he was, I'm sure he was. and. There was an associate producer whose name escapes me, and I don't have an IMDb thing printed out. And Weiler used this this gentleman, and I can't. Oh, remember. I think it's Lester Koenig that you're yeah. talking about. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Lester Koenig did a lot of work on this film. Yeah. And would be subsequently blacklisted. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Lester did a lot of work on this film. Yeah, uh, with, with Weiler and and Weiler worked a lot with the actors and so forth. I mean, he was involved in everything as he was, but this was this was a collaborative effort. Weiler didn't do all of this by himself. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, before we uh, go to the next questions, uh, we had a question in the chat earlier about the pictures on your wall, Alan. Are those photos of actors you've interviewed or is it just some? Uh, these some... are, <laughs> I'm not gonna take the camera and oh, sure, no. <laughs> give you a tour of my room, but I will just say- Just in general. Uh, in general, these are actors that I have either had as guests at one of my film festivals. Some of them are friends. Uh, there's one on the top that June Lockhart, there's a picture of my good friend, Mickey Knox, who was playing tennis with Tony Quinn. And he gave me that picture. And then a bunch of stuff signed by Elizabeth Scott, Barbara Hale, Mitchum, all these people. But the most important one is the one of the woman that's over my left shoulder, the big one. And that's a picture taken by Edmund Bauer Hesser, the famous photographer. And it's a picture of my mother when she was about 21 years old. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thanks. Okay, now back to the hands up. Uh, Lisa, then Ed. Of course it's your mom. She's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> she was, she, takes she was precedence. indeed. Um, I'm with Bob, some golden nugget dialogue here. I started writing them down. Um, not a lot. I've divided my commentary into four sections in prep. Um, it was the start of the one. My favorite is, is like, Lieutenant, policing is an impersonal business. That was, that was sweet. And then when they're in the room together and Kirk Douglas says, mind if I shave? And he goes, got to have the last word, don't you? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's and, a great one. Um, and then, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, pull. Have you got friends with push? And I must remember that when I'm in my next argument. Um, <laughs> I am, I am someone who tends to. I don't know why. I just look at the peripherals of things initially, and from the get go, I wrote down 
when that car is pulling in to bring Lee Grant to the to the building, and it's like, I first thought, are these mobsters because of the way they're parking, and also that they got out of the car and the taxi guy was like, oh, this is this is fine, and you realize I said we don't know if he's a mobster or a cop. Are we showing the gun checkoff style? So it's like already setting you up to see the police as uh, a little more textured. Um, one of the things that, that as soon as I saw it in the credits, I realized it kind of possessed me. Edith Head did the costumes in this. And I just really started to look at the costumes. And of course, because of me, I started to look at the women. Um, and every woman in that film, that doesn't matter what your class, has an elegant touch to her. That scarf around Lee uh, Grant's neck what is just like, yeah. The other thing is, um, and I know I, my friends keep telling me you have to see it for as it is in the time, but ev pretty much down the line, all these wonderfully dressed women. Um, and uh, my God, you have a woman coming in who's been robbed and she's wearing evening gloves that are black up to her elbow in a perfectly checkered match. As like, I, I want to live in my house like that. But <laughs> All of the women are presented. I mean, the first time you have a woman even addressed, she's called a slob. She's called it. It is a slob, right? Mm -hmm. And I felt up until we see Mary, um, they're all either hysterical, neurotic. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that kind of stuck. And um, but uh, I guess the other thing that, and, and, and Bob, thank you for, because I was thinking there's more between those two guys that they're not showing. And you're saying that in the stage production, the two criminals guys were gay. Sorry that that couldn't be played out more, but then we're at a time, what was it in Hitchcock, Hitchcock Hitchcock's uh, Strangers on a Train? You showed somebody was a homosexual by what they ordered. Like he ordered lamb and mint jelly. Woohoo. So um, uh, the other thing that struck me and I had to stop to make sure I was seeing this right. And I'm wondering if it was in the play as well. That's the first time I've ever seen a black policeman and a detective, right? And I was like, was that in the stage production? I cannot, and granted, I don't have as diverse and wide a spectrum of viewing of noir but i was like they're giving this man a club he actually was kind of yeah so i was wondering if you might speak a little bit to edith head but more to that because that was really unusual to me i mean i was happy for it but i just thought i had thought that would be in some ways more of an issue than the abortion we're giving a black guy a police we're giving him a gun well a bat Okay, you got to start somewhere. But anyways, so well, I think he, I think he, I think that cop had uh, he had a gun on. He was a sworn officer, right? And he had a nightstick. So yeah, he was he was in there. And I think I I, I don't know whether there was an African American actor playing a cop in this in the stage play. I I don't know that, uh, but uh, I think that a lot of that has to do with Weiler. And, and he was, Weiler was a very uh, robust, uh, I want to say liberal, but uh, I, I, that, that's, not, that's inadequate. I think he was a humanist on Thank stuff. You. And in Thank fact, you. when Weiler was in the Army Air Corps uh, uh, and he made Memphis Bell, and, and in fact, if any of you have um, HBO Max or HBO and all of that streaming stuff, there's a documentary that was made on Weiler about Weiler's documentary Memphis Bell called mm. the Cold Blue, the Cold Blue, and okay. uh, I you. I actually screened that at the Legion and it's a fabulous fabulous documentary. But at any rate, Weiler was in uniform I think as a as a light colonel or a major, and he was in a hotel in Washington, and uh, somebody there said, uh, Yeah, well we don't want to rent this room, they were talking to another guest to some lousy Jew and Weiler stepped up in uniform <laughs> and decked the guy. And he, he almost, he, he almost, he got called on the carpet and it all got squashed. But that was how Weiler dealt with, with bigotry and anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so he was a very, very forthright guy. And I, not knowing the circumstances of that actor's appearance in the film, it might mm -hmm. just have been he was the right guy or that it was from the stage play. But uh, not knowing the exact details, I like to think he was in the movie because Willie Wyler was the director. And I like to think that as far as Edith Head goes, well, you know, her her uh, her reputation as a uh, costume designer and dresser mm -hmm. is unparalleled. Her career is unparalleled, uh, paramount. I will say that with um, uh, costume designers and uh, production designers, particularly during the studio system, when the studios were, you know, cranking out 300 films a year or whatever, a lot of times the head of the department got the credit when somebody else did the actual work on this or that film. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's no reason for me to disbelieve that, that Edith Head did not approve uh, and was involved with the design and approval of all that wardrobe. The thing that I liked about Detective Story from a production design is, guess what? It was 1950. There was no freaking air conditioning in the summer in New York. <laughs> oh, God. Everything oh, God. is hot. Everybody mm -hmm. is sweaty. And the first thing you see is big, burly Burt Freed, who looked like, uh, you know, looked like a Kodiak bear with his shirt oh, and his freaking gun and everything. And you see, he turns around and you see all the right. sweat on his back yeah. coming through his shirt. And you can tell that it's sticky. It's hot. It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They're these cops are tired. They're burned out. They're tired. Everyone that comes in there. There's so many people that come in there and lie about what they're doing that they they take nothing at face value. But at, mm -hmm. at the same time, I like that little vignette where the guy comes in and he says, "Hey, I was standing there, and this guy <laughs> picked my pocket, and he <laughs> this whole." pants side out and then he says do you have any id and he reaches for his wallet and both <laughs> frank Thale and the cop laugh at the same time uh, uh which you know those little those little bits of business i think added so much to the authenticity and the entertainment value of the film uh, i i think i in the third act and this is i guess my closing comment because I never know what else I might say. <laughs> but um, um, it's funny because the third act, I'm thinking, oh, this is like Oedipus Rex without the incest. Okay, I got it. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I'm very grateful, like Bob, very grateful for this recommendation and appreciative of your presence. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm, appreci I'm appreciative of your presence and everybody's <laughs> participation here in your comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, Lisa. Lisa. Okay, we've got Ed next and then Gary. Yeah, I, um, I, I, the shoplifter, uh, I think, could have been a movie by itself. Uh, yeah. That was such an interesting character. Uh, I hated when she left the movie with 20 minutes left. That's kind of like it was a downer. Um, you know, uh, and yeah, it, it, it almost made me feel like, you know, she was a superfluous character or, you know, but she added so much, uh, you know, when she left early, it's like, she could have been paramount to the closing scene in some kind of, um, voice of reason or something. Uh, I don't know, but, um, what, what are your thoughts on the shoplifter character? I thought I thought she was great. I mean, uh, Lee Lee Grant is the last woman standing, the last person that's alive that had anything to do with this film, as far as I know. And she's ninety three, I believe, this year. And uh, she was fabulous. She went on to have a fabulous career as not only an actress but as a documentary filmmaker. Uh, and uh, Lee was blacklisted. Uh, because of her husband, and believe it or not, the government wanted her to name her husband. <laughs> How do you like that? Uh, and uh, and of course, she refused to do that. And um, if you read Lee's book, uh, this went on until you know everyone thinks that blacklisting ended at a certain time where it was like a race, and then uh, Kirk Douglas uh, burst across the tape with Spartacus or Exodus. And the blacklisted ended and, 
you know, this, these, these promo ads on TCM of I broke the blacklist. Well, that, that wasn't exactly how it worked at all. And her blacklisting went on into the 60s until finally she had a lawyer that was able to get her off the hook uh, uh, where the guy, uh, someone in Washington owed this lawyer a favor and they took her name off the list and cleared her and so forth. And it was, and it was, uh, it, it was because that, and she spoke at J. Edward Bromberg's funeral. So for those, for those sins, she was consigned to working uh, mostly on stage and in early television in the 50s and didn't have much of a Hollywood career until later. But I think, I think Lee is, uh, she's fabulous, a fabulous person, fabulous actress. And I think she's, she's just great in the film and she's central to the film. And uh, yeah, you know, when, when she does leave and goes to night court with Bert Freed, you kind of know, you kind of sit up and go, okay, we're going to come to the climax now. Something, we're, we're coming to the end. And maybe that was part of the reason for doing that, that they, they were kind of clearing everything out to shift the focus to those characters in the, uh, the denimate. So, mm -hmm. any rate, good question, good statement. Thank you. Hey, Gary, you're Thank next. You. I want to join the folks who have said, what a wonderful movie this was. And thank you so much for putting this on my radar. I had never heard of it before. Um, and it is now uh, uh, maybe in my top 10, but I just absolutely loved it, blew me away. Um, and I know we've concentrated a lot tonight in our comments on um, how much of the period it is or how certain parts of it are dated. I just also wanna talk about how incredibly fresh and modern it is. That was really what struck me. Um, and in particular, in the first sort of opening 10, 12, 15 or so minutes, when the plot is beginning to form and beginning to take shape. But what is the central character is the precinct itself. Um, and the ensemble cast and the interaction of everybody. And you've got so many little stories that are, or the little threadlets that are going on, uh, the little bits of stage business you referred to that are just so well done. I mean, I love that woman who comes in and says, I'm being spied on. And he says, I know I need to stay here because the president's going to call me back. You know, I'm working on this. I mean, just those little things that, that just felt so modern, so contemporary and you, you know, there were moments I felt like I was watching Barney Miller. You know, that I would, you, you just took the words right out of my mouth. Mine uh, too. Uh, because uh, the other thing I thought of is how much this influenced Stephen Bakhto when he made Hill Street Blues. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the, it, it, you can see that this is so much of an influence of so many television shows and movies that followed it, uh, Gary, it's, it's, there, there's absolutely, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And in fact, Dennis Farina, uh, who came to a screening of Cry Danger, <laughs> that I, I was, no, New York Confidential, and he shows up and some kid gets me and says, Alan, Dennis Farina's here. And I said, well, let him in. <laughs> so he, he comes in and he's wearing the camel's hair coat he wore when he was on law and order and i said let me guess that's law and order wardrobe he says you're right i kept it <laughs> but but i i asked him we we had a brief conversation about police movies and i i said what do you he says i'm here making a show and i saw the ad that this is going tonight he says i'm a big richard connie fan and i love richard connie and you know, I'm old enough. I saw this when it came out in 1955, so I want to watch it. I, you know, and um, but he said, of all the movies and the TV shows, the most realistic because he was a cop in Chicago, the most realistic uh, situational thing about how a squad room is is Barney Miller, <laughs> and I never and I never forgot that that he said that. And that cop who you said had the sweaty back. Yeah. yeah. And at one point, I remember he's like typing up and the guy's staring at him. So he just like pushes back with his typewriter and everything. You know, that was Sergeant Wojohowicz's father. <laughs> there you go. 
he didn't he didn't have the autographed baseball on his desk but yeah it was wojo's father oh i love it that's awesome yeah, yeah. yeah. i got the theme song awesome. in my head great, great great observation great observation that's awesome um anyone else have some comments questions i i do agree um gary with you about how modern and topical it seemed to me i mean i we didn't we kind of talked around it and everything but i was struck by you know just the the boldness of that topic even being masked in the way that it was for um production code um for it to be just the main part i had never heard about this movie as either and as i was watching it i was feeling very um depressed and kind of triggered about the way that the men were treating women and and even just the 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 general sensibility and then of course you have to put that oh that's right it was the 50s and that was you know hard yeah. to be in that space but i also was struck at how they didn't allow well not allow how the women even though they were being put upon and sort of belittled or whatever they still were very strong so it was you know, the sister of the, you know, the, the model who is always in love with this guy comes up with the money to say, hey, let's bail him out. And, you know, don't you know that, that I know she's pretty and everything, but I've always been here for you. And it didn't come off as sappy or, or victim. It came off as I'm here for you. I'm, I'm your strength. Right. And the, the shoplifter, even though she was very skittish and everything, she really had some, um, you know, she wasn't sure, and she was trying to, you know, connect with any uh, able man in the in the room. Um, but she kind of gave a good presence for the women that were left in the room. And of course, Mary, Mary was, you know, the strength. And those, I mean, talk about some some great side eyes as she was giving it really <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. at the yeah. end. And I was really glad that um, I almost felt like. I was worried that, um, you know, it was going to be okay and they were going to get back together, but he still was harboring this, this thing for her, um, and, and her past. Um, and then when the lawyer triggered, um, Kirk Douglas again, and he just completely lost it because he hadn't even thought about the fact that, you know, she had might've been with other people and that just ruined him. Um, you know, she could have been very apologetic and everything, but she was like, no, wait, you know what? No, I, I don't need this. I don't want this. You are a problem. You have an issue. You have anger management issues. You have, you know, like superiority have, issues. And you, I'm you, you have your, you have your father. In yes, you. you have your you father. Have, yes. in your son with, and that's what the did father. That and I, at the is. end where he's dying and he says, the poor devil, he probably couldn't help himself either. Right. And right. there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of cosmic truth in that. And I agree with you about the women, you know, when you get past the the 70 year old stereotypes and the casual uh, uh, mistreatment and disregard uh, by men of the women in the film, uh, the women, uh, particularly Kathy O'Donnell and certainly Eleanor Parker is to paraphrase Bard Broderick Crawford, they have spine. <laughs> they have spine. Definitely. And all of that. So uh yeah, it's thank, it's, thank uh, you for recommending really this movie. I think yes. it was you, Alan, that, that recommended yeah, this oh, movie. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I, I do have to say when I look through the available movies that are available, mm -hmm. this was the best one. And not coincidentally, I said, well, I've done the commentary track on it, so I don't have to really, I don't have to do a lot of do the work. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me not, let me not convince you that I am not lazy when it's situation. <laughs> I mean, clearly you did the work to be able to do the commentary. It's not like yeah, you're coming absolutely. in, but, but it's also, absolutely. it's also. Um, but uh, it's a really, um, it's a really good movie. And yeah. I think it, it, uh, it transcends time because I think uh, as Gary and others have said that, and 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 you, Darnese, that that there's so much of it that is still so relevant, and the the casual uh, brutality and roughneckness of cops that I dealt with as a young man, and no, I won't trot out any stories, but but you know when when Bendix uh, kicks Joe Wiseman viciously in the shin. <laughs> and says one more peep one <laughs> you know 
I mean, that was, those are the police that I grew up with. Those were the police that I grew up with. I did not grow up with, with, with Abe Vigoda and, 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 and those guys. I, I grew, I had, we had a different breed of cop in Northern New Jersey. Oh, you know? wow. And if you were doing something wrong and you ran and they caught you, that was payback. And yeah. that was clearly understood. That was clearly understood. Uh, and, so, and mostly yeah. because they were out of shape and they didn't want to run, so they were just mad at well, you for they, being yeah, run they, too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they, but yeah, and and they had all that equipment on. But if if you ran as I did once and they caught you, there would be retribution, and it wasn't a surprise. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I, I think the the attitude, uh, the casual brutality, the the cynicism uh of the police and everything i think that that was very real then and i think it's very real now yeah. well before we get to our recommendations i think um there's two lessons that we've learned tonight and first i'm so delighted that so many people enjoyed this especially people that had not seen it before or didn't even know it existed so the first lesson is stay with the great movies you're going to see some great stuff maybe that you haven't seen before and second go to a Noir City Film Festival because that's where I saw this movie for the first time. I didn't know it existed. Go to a Noir City Film Festival. There's there's plenty of others. Chicago's coming up. DC's coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan, you can probably fill us in on the rest of the ones that are coming up, but go to a Noir City Festival. Yeah, uh, one of the things I'm excited about in Chicago, one of the many things, is um, the last night, Thursday, which I think is uh, August 31st, uh, I'm showing two movies that uh, uh, we've never shown before in Chicago, and they're not on DVD, and they're not on Blu-ray, and they're not on streaming. And that's uh, Playgirl with Shelley Winters, Unbound, and uh, The Cruel Tower, which is a Lou Landers-directed, low-budget allied artist movie with a bunch of steeplejacks uh, led by Charles McGraw, who at five foot 10 plays a character named Stretch. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, 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 these, these are not, you know, the, the undiscovered versions of Citizen Kane that have been hiding, but they're a lot of fun. And I um, uh, hope the audience, uh, I'm sure the audience will enjoy that. And I'm looking forward to seeing all my Chicago Noristas and, and friends there. And I really appreciate uh, Andy, you and Darnese having me back here. And I appreciate everybody's participation and the questions. Uh, this is a really great group. So I, I thank you for uh, indulging me with this. It was great. Well, Alan, thank you so much. And, and we're not gonna let you go yet because we want you to make a recommendation or two, but, but again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay. So, well, so is there a film like uh, detective story, or maybe has some of the same cast directors that you would recommend to us. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, the first uh, thing I got to think about that. Mind. You're catching me. You're catching me uh, off guard. I, I do think uh, one that I am showing in Chicago that most of you have probably seen is the 1949 version of All the King's Men. And and I don't know. Uh, I think that I showed that film. I think two or three years ago in Palm Springs, and uh, I found out to my surprise, a lot of people didn't know about the film. Uh, a lot of people didn't even know Broderick Crawford won an Oscar for it, or that Broderick Crawford won an Oscar for anything. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, without trying to uh, wade into politics, I think that. The, a, a lot of the um, uh, the narrative and the performances and everything and all the King's men have real resonance nowadays uh, with with what's been going on with our politics and so forth. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a weird dichotomy where, you know, you can look at Crawford's portrayal of Willie Stark and see something that's that's positive. Uh, but it's it's really a powerfully, beautifully written movie. Uh, Mercedes McCambridge is fabulous. Uh, even John Ireland is is good before he put his kind of career on cruise control. And it's it's a really good movie. And it's really worthy, uh, I think, of being watched. So if you all have not seen All the King's Men and you're not going to be in Chicago the last week of August, I encourage you to seek that out. 
Great. Awesome. Great. Does anybody else have any recommendations? Well, I'll say a couple that were, well, one that was in the chat, I think Lisa mentioned that if you go to Internet Archives and look up Detective Story, you'll see um, some great recommendations there as well. Okay, so, great. Um, option. Oh. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Alan, sorry. Uh, I just thought of something. I, I saw a comment by Debbie that Kirk Douglas's character reminded me of Dirty Harry, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he'd probably find that funny. Uh, I said uh, when I spent my time with him, uh, uh, I had to film him doing an introduction to The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, his first picture. And so uh, I'll, I'll give you the short version, but uh, he was sitting at a desk with this, I love you wall, letters from presidents and pictures and all this stuff. And Kirk's there on his desk. In fact, this, this video is going to be on this Blu-ray uh, that's coming out. And I think it's on my website. But at any rate, I said, uh, I said, we were filming where the camera was shooting over my shoulder. He was in the center of the frame and he was talking to me, but I wasn't in the frame of the shot. And I said, Kirk, do you want me to ask you any questions? And he goes, nope. He says, they used to call me one take Douglas, you be the judge. And so <laughs> he starts, he drops his head and I'm standing there with the, with the crew and everything. And I felt like Eric von Stroheim at the end of Sunset Boulevard. So I said, speed, action. And he snapped his head up and said, the strange love of Martha Ivers, my very, and he talked and told all these stories for about nine minutes. And then he said, and that's why I'll always remember the strange love of Martha Ivers, my very first picture. And I said, cut, print. And Kirk leans forward and goes, what do you think? Pretty fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said to him, I said, uh, Kirk, um, uh, you know, you've played a lot of bastards but none better than Chuck Tatum and Ace in the Hole. And he goes, wasn't that a great fucking movie? <laughs> Unfortunately, it was ahead of its time, but boy, Billy Wilder was this and that. And I had told the cameraman, keep the camera rolling when I engage him. <laughs> and uh, so his assistant, who was very smart, uh, a nice young lady came and goes, Alan, does Kirk know you're still filming him? I go, oh, are we still, are we still filming him? I said, go ahead and take off, the, turn the camera off, you know? So I kept talking to him and of course the camera operator, you know, he's like rolling up the cord and he hadn't unplugged it. So I got about, I got about like, you know, uh, four or five minutes of unauthorized footage of, of Kirk. But, uh, nice. He was, awesome. he was great. He was, he was awesome and, and was, was very kind to me and, uh, 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 not not a story that everyone would tell about working with Kirk Douglas, but I don't think when you're 47 and you become 90, you're the same person. He had been through a stroke, a helicopter crash, uh, a lot of different things, but uh, he was still Spartacus, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. We all are. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, Jeff. <laughs> Um, this is kind of a wild ass out of left field uh, recommendation, but I, I do see kind of a thematic a similarity. Uh, and that's uh, The Swimmer from 1968 with uh, Burt Lancaster. Uh, it, it, similar to this movie in that they're both about taking a life of a, of a person and peeling it back to, to show all the real sickness underneath. Um, it, it's it's pretty different. It's not really like much of anything else you might ever see, but uh, uh, look it up. Uh, the Swimmer, 1968 with Burt Lancaster. Yeah, good pick. Good pick, Jeff. I like that. Yeah, um, Ed asked if that was based on the short story. Do you know? It, I think it's a John, John Cheever. It's a yeah, John Cheever story, yeah. 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 Yep. Awesome. Yep. All right. I think I think we are done with the recommendations. That's it. We usually yeah. have like 46 recommendations. I know, but I think I think everybody is sort of like just enjoying yeah. that moment and just kind of, you know, I mean, yes, we compared it to Barty Miller and 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 Law and Order and yeah. you know, he's he's no Lenny Briscoe, but um in terms of movies, I think we've we've gotten some good uh good feedback and I think so too. Um I well, did put um Alan's yeah. uh, um I didn't put the full URL, but 
Um, you can find Alan at alankrody.com. Um, so check out his his um, his articles and and a lot of the things he has on there. Yeah, I have a I have a book coming out oh, good. in February uh, called uh, Blood on the Moon and the Birth of the Noir Western, and it's about the movie Blood on the Moon with Robert Witch Mitchum, directed by Robert Wise, and it's about all of that stuff, uh, the movie, the Western writer whose book was adapted and how Westerns and film noir kind of bled into one another in the, after World War II and into the 50s and so forth. So uh, I've got that going on and I'm, I'm working, I need to be working harder on a biography of Elizabeth Scott that I am working on. So I'm, uh, I'm staying busy, but uh, always have time for this group and Darnese and Andy. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Alan, thank you so much. We, uh, we are in, in your debt. Yeah, thank definitely. You. And, and you can't hear it, but everyone's well, clapping. Yeah, you know, <laughs> well, as, as the late great Paul Servino said, place got hit by lightning, pay me. <laughs> Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I love so, you all. Gotta all go. right. Thank you again, Alan. So, um, one thing before, um, uh -huh. we usually put the feedback link in here, but it seems to be broken. So I just wanted, to, I put another link in the form. This is the tell us what you think page that we have on our library. So, you know, tell us what you think about this program. Um, you know, I, it sounds like everybody enjoys it and we, we're glad that we can provide this for you. Um, but if you'd like to drop a little, uh, a little uh, tidbit in the in the website. We would love to hear it. It's very much appreciated. Bye bye, guys. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great uh -oh. weekend. Oh, Watch no, some great bad. movies, and take care. Bye.